Hey, everybody. Welcome again to the Mosaic Podcast. Every single episode that I do feels like such a fresh new start. Today, I'm interviewing someone who I've never met until 10 minutes ago when we had our pre-conversation. And I can't tell you how excited I am to introduce this guy to you. There are certain people that look at life the way we've always looked at life, but see it differently. And Matthew's one of those people. His, his concepts are interesting. His definitions are different. The way he looks at life is it will, will give you a perspective that maybe you've never seen before. And everything about our show is seeing what you see but also seeing what you don't see. So it's a privilege of mine to have Matthew Ferry on the show today. And let me tell you a little bit about him, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna read you his bio, and you know, everybody who knows me knows I'm not a script guy, so we're gonna go off a script as soon as we finish his bio. But I just wanna give you a sense of who he is, okay? Matthew Ferry is a master life coach and spiritual teacher. He's, the best sell, he's a best-selling author, and he's a thriving executive life coach. For the last 26 years, Matthew's coached thousands of top per performers to achieve what he calls enlightened prosperity, which he's trademarked. His books, videos, audios, and seminars utilize his street-tested methodology called the rapid enlightenment process, which he's trademarked. Among his many projects, Matthew manages a blog, hosts the podcast Daily Enlightenment with Matthew Ferry, spearheads the Ignite Mastermind, and teaches his unique process via muscle testing school. If you're not already intrigued, we're going to dive in more because there's a lot of things in just what I've read. Matthew is also the author of a book, Quiet Mind, Epic Life. Quiet Mind. What a beautiful concept. And we're going to go into that a little bit too, because what happens when the mind is quiet? What an exquisite state of mind. He and his family live in Southern California. And for more information, we'll post this below. His website is matthewferry.com. Matthew, from the depth of my heart and soul, I want to thank you for coming on to the show, and I want to welcome you to the Mosaic Podcast. Thank you, brother. Glad, glad to be here. It's, it's an absolute honor. We've had a little bit of conversation prior, and what I want to try and do is be completely transparent, because I've, I've seen some of your talks, and I've seen some of your podcasts, and I've listened to a bunch of the ones that you've done. And I, want to, I wanted to get you off script. I wanted to get people to know th this guy, this beautiful and exquisite human being that sits before me from a, from a personal point of view and less as a teacher. And we'll go into the teaching because you have a lot to give people. But what do you do for fun? For fun, I like to uh, discover what's going on in my consciousness. And uh, for fun, I am intrigued by... Um, what the reaction is that I'm having to things or what the reaction other people are having. I, you know, I, I think I'm probably a little weirder than most. Uh, uh, the things that are intriguing to me are the human experience. Uh, then, you know, it, it expands out from there. I love, I love to make music, create music. I love to experience music. I love uh, art. I want to be uh, immersed in nature, immersed in in um, things that uh, assault my senses or delight my senses. Uh, just the experience of being on the planet. That those things, those things really turn me on. And I love doing all that with my wife and with my kids. How many kids do you have? I've got four kids. I got a 24 year old and a, a 18 year old who just went to college. I've got a 16 year old and 11 year old, all boys. Wow. Who would have known that? You look like you're 24 yourself. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's great. 
when was the last time you you had that uncontrollable laugh that comes from your gut? And what did what what caused you to laugh that hard? Uh, it was probably last week when I was up in Mammoth Lakes, California, with my kids, and we were all I think we were all playing Uno at the time, and uh, you know the we were just all joking and being silly and being crazy and being uh, outrageous. And, you know, it just got to a point where, you know, all of us were in hysterics uh, just being with each other and, and, you know, the, the laughter, you know, overtook us. Fabulous. Love it. Um, in listening to a lot of your things, I have my idea of what, of the answer to this question, but I could care less what my idea of the answer to this question is. I'd like to know where you sit. In the life that you live, where do you think you live most of your time? Do you live in your head or in your heart? Uh, neither, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that uh, the head is extraordinarily limiting. The heart is unbearably limiting. Uh, I would say that I live most of my time in the environment. And uh, in the, I just have this experience most of the time, Danny, that I don't experience quite the body. I don't experience the, the, the system as much as I experience the, uh, the, the what's going on around me. And uh, it's, it's almost like a, a spider in the middle of the spider web. Hmm. And all the all the different signals that I'm getting from all around, um, I would say that that's that's probably the vast majority of my time. Uh, sometimes I turn on my brain and I do uh, thinking. Uh, most of the time, when I do thinking or I do writing, or if I'm uh, like writing out a video script or something like that, or or uh, um, a, an article, I will simply open up. Let's just open up my. Uh, self and let it all come through. And then the, the nice thing is, is that I've got a, I've got a, uh, um, a software package that has been highly refined and trained to, uh, to communicate things. So he's let things come through, go through that package and, and come out. Um, so I want to make sure, I want to make sure our listeners are understanding that isn't a computer software package. That's a human yeah, software package. That's right. <laughs> okay. All right. Go ahead. I got a software package uh, <laughs> called uh, um, my uh, genetic predisposition, then my uh, uh, soul predisposition, then the then the training and the development that I have done over the you know over the years that I've been developing myself that uh, that allow me to be completely free, allow things to come in and and then go through that system out. So. I don't know if that's actually in my head. I don't. I don't think it is. Yeah. Uh, and um, when I when I tune into my heart, there's very powerful information there. But typically, I'm tuning into um, my seventh chakra above my head, and I'm I'm allowing whatever that information is to be the the dictator or the dominant experience for myself. So for people who aren't experienced in chakras, which maybe most of us are, I just want to, there is an energy system from the East that talks about seven energy centers in the body. They go up the, basically up the spine. And when the seventh energy center is, a, is literally above, above the head. And so um, what I, what I want to explore with you, because like, One of the things I love about you is the way you blow the mind with your mind. Because it feels like when I'm talking to you, you're talking about thoughts and concepts and, and ideas and, and brilliance more than feelings. But you talked about a feeling that you have of the spider being enmeshed in the web where you feel everything around you. What I want to know is what that feels like. Because for people who don't have that experience, like what the heck is he talking about? And I want you to dumbify it down, not dumbify it to people who are stupid. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Can I, uh, I want to actually back up and address the idea of feelings because um, there was uh, a big majority of my life where 
uh, feeling or emotion was the dominant experience that I was having. And when my mind went quiet back in 2006, I, I had this like this realization that emotion itself, like human beings are, are so invested in emotion. And, and I, I realized, my God, <laughs> I thought that emotion is what I was or what my experience was. And as my mind went completely silent and all of a sudden I was experiencing everything at the exact same time, I progressively began to realize that the emotions that I were, was feeling was predominantly a an holdover, a holdover from the physiological unit that was, um, it was, it was about guidance. So positive feelings were about guiding me towards something and negative feelings were about moving me away from something. And, and um, this is an unbelievably unpopular point of view, but I'm going to say it anyways, because you, wanted, you wanted the no bullshit version. I uh, want um, it straight out. You wanted the straight out, straight in. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to lay it out and give you some, uh, uh, you know, a very unpopular spiritual point of view. You ready? Yeah. Let's let people decide if it's popular or unpopular. We That's don't have right. To pre, we don't have to predispose being, being, so when your mind goes quiet and you recognize that this body system is nothing more than an expression of consciousness manifesting into whatever it is that we're experiencing. When you, when you recognize that we're all one thing expressing itself with infinite variety, like when you get that, when it is, when it is what you are, emotions disappear yeah you have i mean i experience like a just a general joy on a regular basis um i'm generally uh you know happy easygoing guy uh uh but in general what i've noticed is that emotions are really a holdover they're a holdover that we've turned into or created meaning around that doesn't exist. There is no, the meaning of emotions is not real. Time out. And so this Time I, out. Let me, let me interrupt your question because yeah. I want to know what a holdover means. When we, a holdover okay. from, from the times in which your, uh, your ancestors, your ancestry, be that uh, genetic or consciousness um, that your the holdover from your ancestors, tens of thousands. So generational. Hundred, you're yep, talking about generational, generational stuff that comes down. That's handed. Yeah, down. let's call it. Let's let's call it. You know, a hundred thousand years ago, when you were much hairier than you are now. I don't uh, know if I ever was hairier than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> In, intelligence so you want to think about it in this way like intelligence and understanding diminishes emotion and and it diminishes so, uh, emotion hold on i want to get you off of your i want to get you off of your wheel yeah okay? lay it on me because we could go exactly the other way yeah let's go for it real feeling not emotion you're you're equating feeling and emotion is the same word I'm not equating that. Emotions are emotions and feelings are feelings. When you have the feeling of love and that is, that there is an, it, it is beyond emotion. It is, when you have the feeling of oneness, it's beyond emotion. But those yeah. are feelings and those in the same way that your thoughts in, incapacitate yeah. your feeling, your emotions, your, you, those feelings incapacitate your thoughts. Are you with me? Yeah, I would say um, in, uh, I've never had the experience of the thoughts being incapacitated. I've had the experience that the- uh, Stop for a minute, stop. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, because this is, this is, you intrigue me. And I want you to, I want to, I want to zero it down. The quiet mind is the thoughtless mind. Is the thoughts being incapacitated in my understanding of what that is. So when you say you've never had it, I, all I believe you have is had it but somehow the definitions of your mind experiencing and explaining it wants you to go back into the language that you have given up in your experience because it, it's hard to explain. And what I'm trying to do is narrow down because this idea of a quiet mind, yep. 
our thought, I, I, the mosaic, my book, has taught me a very simple thing. Our thoughts become our words, our words become our stories, and our stories become our life. And if we have a quiet mind where our thoughts are quiet, wow, what's open to you? And that's what I believe the beauty and the nectar and the exquisiteness of the work you're doing is. But I don't see it in this de- in this definition. And pardon me for pardon me for pushing you back. You you want to you want to talk about emotion? Let me get let, let me get. I want to talk about feeling. I don't want. I'm going to say that that uh, you're distinguishing feeling and emotion as uh, um, separate things. Let's just categorize them all as sensation. They're all sensation. So you might have a sensation that is that is um, being produced from your nervous system that is saying, you know, get the hell out of here. Or you might have a sensation that says, all is well. Uh, And there's an an infinite variety in both directions. And when your mind goes quiet, the sensations that are left is all all is well. And when you're the when you're the spider on the web, you can experience other people's uh, um, anxieties and frustrations, and you see that the world is a fear-based world. Um, but you you're in the you're op, you're observing it rather than experiencing it, and uh, and that is unbelievably uh, effective. Like your life, your life kicks ass when you aren't being pulled into the uh, the the emotional state. When you love, for example, uh, love for most people is actually something biological rather than being a a context or a framework. And really, if we break down what love is, love is acceptance. It is acceptance and appreciation. And acceptance and appreciation are not emotions, and they're not, uh, they're not even sensations. Now, they might have accompanying emotions and sensations. Uh, I prefer to have pleasant feelings. That, that's my preference. Uh, but I'm also completely willing to experience anything that is occurring without any resistance to it. Right. So, again, I want to try and pull this back to not theoretical, not, not the teacher talking to the student. Do it. But to the person and the person yeah. talking to each other. Because, and because. You got, you got me, brother, exactly as I am. And if, if my <laughs> wife and I were having this conversation, this is, this is the way it would go. So I, I want you to pull it back, baby. Let's do it. <laughs> I, want, I want to uncover that layer because I think that layer isn't exactly who you are. So, and, and I believe there's a layer beneath that that is below. I'm, because I'm the ready. same way you speak about the heart and the feeling and the emotions and the sensations, I speak about the mind. And one of the things that completely intoxicates me about just the little bit that I've seen about this idea that you're trying to present of this quiet mind and this, and this epic life is that when we pull back the cover of the mind and we are the spider on that web as you speak and we feel all the sensations of the world around us, we can be neutral to that. But what we can also be is instead of being affected by the sensations around us, we can actually infuse the vibrations of of what we feel which is which is a high higher vibration than the world's experiencing into the room that we walk in and literally transform the room so it's not a place of neutrality where the quiet mind becomes just this receiving station that allows everything to come in and then and takes it like a holding tank which is also a gorgeous place to be like how gorgeous in my book i call him the trash man the trash man comes every Friday to our house and he picks up the trash and everything we don't want, we put outside and he takes it away. And what an exquisite thing to be somebody who can take whatever people don't want from them and help them to take, get rid of all the stuff that they don't need anymore and put it outside. And when they're ready, put it in the truck, grind it up and drive it off so that they can be experienced life without all that stuff, emotions and thoughts and feelings and, and, and pains and sufferings and all of that. But there's another place, and this is the place that I want to see if you speak about, which is that place when you are clean, when there is no noise, 
when there is nothing to interfere, what actually shows up? And how do you walk into a room and instead of being affected by the room you walk into, literally affect the room you walk into by your presence? And you've seen that. It depends on, it depends on who we're talking to. So if we're, if we're talking to someone who has a, an idea that they, that they need to engineer their environment and they need their environment to, to shift to fit the modality that they're trying to create, There's, they have a goal, a dream, or whatever, uh, then for that person, we, we will simply say that when your mind is quiet, the most amazing information and ideas come through you walk into a room and you are a blank slate and yet you have an intention it's not your intention you're an expression of the intention and as you go go into the room there's an ordering that occurs so high consciousness is a higher order of integrity you talk about higher uh vibration and that higher vibration is is more organizing than the lower vibration or lack of integrity. And so if I'm talking to the person who is up to something, which is typically the person I like to deal with, if, I, if you're up to something and you come into that room with a quiet mind, everything begins to move in a direction of your intention. Your, who you are transforms everything in the room when you're in that quiet mind state. But when you, are, when you are disturbed by your own attachments, disturbed by the need to look good, disturbed by the, by the desire to have people think that you are this way or that way, those, those are disturbances because those disturbances assume that you're important, that you're valuable, that things need to happen. And the truth is you don't matter. Your life doesn't matter. Nothing matters. And anything that you say matters is nothing more than a context or a framework. And it's all pre, uh, the predisposition in it is survival. Mm -hmm. So when you walk into a room and your mind is in this completely free, clear state, meaning there's no reason for it to engage, things just start happening. Essentially what you would call miracles yeah. start to occur. Love it. I mean, and let's, let's bring it back to earth a little because you're bringing it back to earth with what we're talking about, but they're metaphysical concepts. I'm working with someone who's a speaking professional and she, and, she's, and she talks about the fact that so little of what people hear when you give a presentation are your words. It's like 7% of the 100% of what they hear is your words. Some of it is your stories, but most of it is how you show up and who your presence is. So what you're saying on a very practical way of communicating in the world is 100% right. And it comes from this sort of sense of quiet, of quieting down. Yogananda, who is, who is my spiritual teacher, had a beautiful saying. He said, center everywhere, circumference nowhere. When you are centered in every single cell and have no circumference around you, then everything that exists comes through you and you're a part of everything that exists without defining the borders and boundaries of those walls. Let's talk about your practice. Let's talk about what you help people to experience. But first, I'd like to know your practice. How did you get to the place where you have experienced, if you have, first of all, do you experience quiet mind? Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't experience uh, much talking at all in my mind. I don't, I haven't experienced uh, any thoughts really, even since we have started. Uh, so yes, the answer is 100% yes. And my mind is, is quiet, probably 95% of the time. And when I say quiet, what I mean by that is uh, there's, there's nothing going on in there that, uh, that isn't summoned. So I will, I will Dude, utilize this. Back up. Use words that people like. Summoned is a cult, is a cult word. I want to I want to use words that are that are just every. Sure. I'm gonna words. work on. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the the we're tightening up the finances this week. So now what I need to do is I need to utilize thinking, 
logic, reason. I need to uh, look for where my attachments are. So I need to like, I need to be intentional about utilizing the, the mental state to my advantage. It's a phenomenal tool and it's a nightmare when it's running the show. Okay. So how do you, let me go somewhere else before I go to how do you. There would be people who would say, friends of mine that I love and adore, who would say to me that as long as you are in the process of utilizing your own processes, you're actually missing the boat. Because when the mind is quiet and you allow something greater than you to come through, there is no utilization of your processes. There's just the ability to surrender and receive. Are you with me on that? 100%. And then you get your tax bill. <laughs> and you get your tax bill. So, <laughs> right? oh. or, and then your parents come over for dinner. Right. Uh, and so, um, you know, my teachers were, uh, were, you know, the deeply spiritual types as well. And what I found is that um, uh, a, a pretty dominant way of operating in the, in the, in the very uh, spiritual community. A pretty dominant way of operating is, uh, is highly spiritual malfunctioning everywhere. Right. And, uh, and that just didn't work for me. I mean, I, I was um, running businesses and I have kids and I'm, I'm uh, a part of a, a family that is a little bit of a dynasty type family. And so you know, I'm, I'm around wealth and prosperity and functionality and all of this stuff that's going on. So uh, there, there was this unbearable pull towards uh, peace. And simultaneously, there's the, there's the life that I'm living. And if, if one cannot blend those two together, then renunciation is the answer. One must renounce life, leave the world, go away. And our mentors in spirituality, when they said, boy, when, when you are just completely in your oneness space, there's nothing to do. That's right. And then the next day you wake up. And there's a list of stuff that you were on the hook that you promised three weeks ago. So there's, there's a, a push-pull. Uh, when, I, when I read things from Eastern mysticism and Buddha and Krishna and, and all of these things, when I read those things, I, I, am, I, am, I am awestruck and, and, I, and I experience the just whoa, through my whole body. And simultaneously, I look at the time in which that information was um, uh, discerned and created, and, and those, the timelines don't match anymore. We're living in a world where we want it all, and we've ascended to a place, Danny, where we can both operate effectively in the world and be in a profound state of peace. And that's a juggling act, but um, integrity, effectiveness, being an empowered individual, uh, if you don't take that stuff on, then your quiet mind will be dis disturbed. Mm -hmm. And if you can't be an effective, empowered individual, then you have to leave or you have to massively reduce your experience of life in order to maintain this. So if you want this and this, you have to be an effective human being, and you have to have a quiet mind. And I will say this, that, that developing your quiet mind gives you a lot of balls, a lot of courage to take on being an effective human being. And I, that's, that was, that's my journey. My journey has been, look, I want to kick ass, but I don't, I don't want to kick ass and hope that someday I get to the peace once everything is organized. I want to be at peace in the process of evolving as a human being. Yeah. So you kind of described better to me the concept of the mosaic, which is the book that I wrote. Because really when we think of our life as just individual pieces, there is no peace. When we, when we, have, when we are a piece, P-I-E-C-E, -E, there's no P-I-E-A-C-E. -E. 
It's really in the piece of joining our pieces together to all the things of our life that our life holds, that that's what achieves us peace. Because if, if one piece has no peace and one piece has peace, the combination of them is some blend of no peace and peace, right? So let's go, let's go through, let's segue a little bit because I love where you're coming from. To the listener out there right now who's saying, yeah, I get what you're saying. I'm in that spiritual camp where I don't have my finances together. Or, yeah, I get what you're saying. I'm in that financial camp where I'm completely unhappy and I don't have my inner peace together. How do they attain the quiet mind? You really got to do four things that I've seen. And, and I just want you to want to back up and say, uh, I've really made a go, really made a go <clears throat> of the traditional processes of getting my mind to go quiet. And there's a lot of it that works very well temporarily. So meditation works incredibly well temporarily. And there were times when I was pushing four hours of meditation a day. But then you come back to real life and real life does not care. Real life, you know, punches you in the face and you're like, ah, you know, now all of a sudden the survival system is activated. Ultimately for me, I had to, I had to figure out how could I operate in a, in a family that is extremely high energy, high powered, success driven. That's my, my family that I come from. How do I operate in that family and be at peace? And ultimately, I had to do four things. I had to, one, identify that the mind itself, which I call the drunk monkey, that's a little nickname I made up uh, you know, in, my, in my 20s. The drunk monkey has functions and it's it is essentially um mechanistic and habitual and if i can recognize what the drunk monkey is doing if i can see oh there it goes it's forecasting the negative oh there it goes it is uh resisting the the failure oh it's avoiding be, uh being embarrassed right if i can see these various functions it gives me a little distance but that I've worked for a decade on that. And so, so stay with me there. Yeah. Um, what is the process that allows someone to act to, to observe the mind or what you call the drunk monkey? What is that process? Because most people are caught in the process of, of seeing the process. And how do they get to the place where they separate their mind from that to just become the observer of the drunk monkey rather than the drunk monkey driving their car? That's the second part. So this, you actually then have to understand or you start to work with what's underneath the drunk monkey. So there are times in which you can observe the drunk monkey, no problem. Your listener probably has a pretty good ability to see, oh God, there goes the mind again, it's doing its thing. But so often the mind is like, ah, you know, it, it drags you with it. And the reason that it's dragging you with it is that observing the mind itself is only like taking your scissors and chopping the weeds off at the top. You actually need to go down and pull out the roots and the roots are something that I call the hidden motives to survive. And this took a lot, this was hard won, man. I will tell you, I, I, it was so embarrassing for me when I was, you know, the master of the mindset and still I was getting railroaded by the mind on a regular basis. And, uh, and it drove me to go deeper into my process. And I was able to discern, in fact, a uh, 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 um, you know, longtime collaborator and I really spent some time trying to figure out what this was. And we were able to discern together that you have underneath the drunk monkey, 
is the actual energetic information that drives it. Stop. Yeah. Um, Because I love that. Okay. So from what I'm hearing you say, the first step in your process is just to become aware of what you actually do. Here goes my mind. It's pulling me over here. Here goes my mind. It's being negative. Here goes my mind. It's being positive. Here goes my mind. At a certain point in time, then the second step of the process is to say, is there something beneath my mind's random, seemingly random activity that could help me govern the process of how my mind moves, how my mind thinks? And then you explore that space and pull out the weed rather than cut off the, but what is your process to do that? There's two components. Uh, One component is through the observation and acknowledgement that greed is running, grudges. So you have greed, grudge, you have uh, victim, you have illogical rules that we follow, you have uh, pride, resistance, Humble, by the way, uh, we relate to humble like it is uh, uh, some revered state, but uh, um, humble is actually a survival technique. And if you look at a pack of dogs, what you see is the alpha male is being dominant. And then as a, a matter of organizing in a survival state, the other members of the pack are being humble. They make themselves intentionally less than in order to make things function and work. So being humble seems like a good idea, but it actually is degrading. Once you recognize that we're all one thing, expressing itself with infinite variety, what are you being humble about? You are everything. You are the thing that you would be being humble to. So anyways, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting off track, but yes. the, you start with observation. That's number one. The second thing that you do is you go through a healing process. And one of the the ways that you can do the healing process is by listening to, I've created a whole suite of free audios for people to listen to that just work on healing the hidden motives. And so um, I can give you that. And is that that far out later? And we'll put, we'll post all those in the, in the show notes. Is that through NLP that you do that? How, how does you, how do your, is that through hypnosis? Is that through, what is the, what I'm trying to get that is you can tell people that you have the most delicious meal ever possible. Yeah. You can have, you can have reviews of your restaurant all over the, all over the, the world. But if the restaurant is never open for people to experience how to do it, they never will experience it for themselves. So what I want to get to is when they come to work with you or when they read your book or when they come in and listen to your audios, what is the experience that you give them that you hope that they will go walk away with that will allow them to go from being led by the drunk monkey, the mind that moves in whatever capacity it moves, wherever it goes, whenever it goes, or seemingly random, pulling us all over the place, making nothing but noise fill our head that, that fills us with sheer disappointment and pain and suffering to that place where you literally bring people into this piece of watching that they are not their mind. They are like, I know what's done that for me. I've meditated for 45 years and I'm going to give a different perspective to the perspective that you've given, which is meditation only takes you so far and then you come out and you have your bills there and it it slams you in the face. That isn't my experience, but I want, I don't care about my experience right now. What I care about is your experience and the people that are relating to the message that you're giving, which is that experience. Okay. If that's their experience, I want them to have, how do they jump into the practice that you do? of watching that drunk monkey and saying, this is not me. What is the practice of that? Is that in your book? Is that in your tapes? Yeah. Is that in a oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, so the practice is one, uh, to implement an awareness process. So awareness makes you flexible. Flexibility reveals new options and options give you power. So you start by observing the drunk monkey. And, and what I try to do is just help people to see the drunk monkey is, is not even remotely random. It's so unrandom, it's ridiculous. It is function-based. 
And when you see, when you recognize, oh my God, what appeared to be random actually is, is a function. The moment you see the function, you no longer buy into the function. So it's like this, I keep having a, uh, I keep having a hole in my foot and it's bleeding all the time. And I keep whining and I've, I have a crutch and I'm limping all the time, what's wrong with me? And then somebody says, uh, that's a gun in your hand, why do you keep shooting yourself in the foot? And I'm like, what? Holy smokes, that is, my, that is a gun. The awareness itself creates a whole new set of flexibility and options, options appear. And now I could say, oh, well, I'm gonna put that gun down. But before, I was just unconscious, bomb, bomb, bomb. I kept shooting myself in the foot, limping, compensating. So awareness is the first step. And in my book, I help people with awareness. And then in my uh, free little five-minute audios on the unconscious, uh, unconscious reflexes and the hidden motives, I give people awareness. The practice, the practice is awareness. And in my book, I have 23 practices that I, that I take people through so that they can... Um, just little little nibbles that help them to stay conscious of these functions. But once you do those two things, right, those are only the first two steps. The next step is to actually connect with what I call enlightened perspectives. And enlightened perspectives, so I am a, I'm a student of a man named Dr. David Hawkins. And Dr. David Hawkins wrote Wild a book. man. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, he, he wrote a, a book uh, called Power Versus Force. And, and over the, since 1999, uh, you know, Wayne Dyer said, you have to read this book. And I was like, I, you know, I don't really read books. I listen to books. I don't read them. And he's like, there is no audio. You have to read it. <laughs> so I read the book and it was the first book that I ever read twice. I, I literally, I finished it and I was like, what? First of all, you must be a genius because it's almost impossible to understand. It I'm was so uh, type well, of mind to understand. I don't, I don't know. Brilliant. I don't know if I'm a genius, but I, what I will tell you is that his stuff just makes sense to me. Here's, here's the second book, which is eye of the eye. Yeah. And the, the, I have to tape it together. I've read it so many times yeah. and it's all falling apart. But here's my point. I devoted myself to understanding how to use his system for measuring consciousness. And I devoted myself to discerning and discovering what were the things, what were the, the ideas that lived in this, you know, quote, enlightened framework. And ultimately what I, I had to step beyond my mentor and stand on his shoulders and I began to realize that really what we're looking for is strength. We want to be fortified. We want to have integrity. And so many of the ideas that we believe actually weaken the physiological system. And you can use muscle testing as, that's one of my tools, you can use muscle testing to discern what weakens you and what strengthens you. Perfect. And so in my book, for example, I put together, you know, 35 different things that people can just reflect upon. And as they reflect upon those things, they are strengthened and fortified. When you're strengthened and fortified, your mind does not need to talk. Your mind talks because there is a problem to solve. There is danger present. There is something wrong. There's something out of sorts. That is the only reason that your mind talks. Your mind is trying to solve a problem, but when you go into the oneness state, there is no problems. Yeah. And when there is no problems, there's no reason for the mind to talk. And then finally, the fourth step is so hold to- on, Hold on, before we okay. go to the fourth step. Yeah. I had the privilege of meeting David Hawkins. When I was at Hay House, I went to his, his little absolute hut outside of Sedona. Yeah. I had the chance to sit with him and be there with him and listen to him. And, and for those people who have never got under, have know nothing about him, buy it. Even if you don't understand it, buy it in the book, power versus force, because, 100%. because you will see a roadmap of consciousness and how you can move from state to state to state to up level your consciousness. 
And if you want to learn how to muscle test in a way that actually gives you the capability of utilizing that framework, uh, it took me, you know, damn near 20 years yeah. to figure it out. So and part of, and part of so what I'm getting to teach people that so that they are not reliant upon anyone. I don't want people relying on me. I don't want them relying on, on, on David and his work. I want people to have, to be empowered to make strengthening choices and decisions and create strengthening contextual frameworks themselves. So from what I'm getting from this conversation so far, and we're really coming, coming we have about 10, 10 or 15 minutes left to just sort of pull it all together. Um, this is not an easy process. The idea of quieting the mind is not an easy process, but I want to, I want to offer another possible perspective to you and to, to the listeners that we have. I have the beauty of having a developmentally delayed daughter. She doesn't, she doesn't communicate like you and I communicate. And what happens is she'll try and say something. And because I've known her almost 30 years, she's almost 30 years old. I've been able to understand her even when I can't understand her words. But sometimes I don't. And when I don't understand her, I'll say, Elisa, will you please just tell me in another way? Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you're trying to say. Because I so badly want to hear what you're saying to me. And she'll try again. And what she'll tend to do after she's tried a couple of times is she'll raise her voice and say it louder, thinking that I just haven't heard it. And she'll, she'll say it louder. When she says it louder, it wasn't because I didn't hear her. It was because the clarity of the way she speaks wasn't enough that I could understand what she was saying. So when she gets frustrated, then she'll create, a, she'll, she'll throw a tantrum. And when she creates a tantrum and I still don't get it, then she'll come running at me and try and bite me or tear my shirt or do something to hurt me. Because it mean, it, she wants me to get it so much and she's so hurt that she doesn't get it. What that little son of a gun taught me is that's what every person in the world I know does. They do exactly the same thing, a little bit more controlled because they're not as free with their conditions to come running and attack me. But if they speak and they don't get heard, they'll scream. If they scream and they don't get heard, they create a scene. If the scene doesn't work, they'll destroy something. It can be a marriage, a relationship, a business, a corporation, a building, a country, a government, whatever they want to do. In talking to you, she came to me right now. And it may be a lot simpler than all this work that you've done because you've done a ton of work. You've done decades and decades and decades of work. And there's so many thoughts and so many things that are going on to analyze each one of them through this process of observing and analyzing and pulling weeds. And there may be a simpler solution. And I would love your thoughts on this. What if we just listened? Because then when the mind is not listened to, it has to continue to speak. But when it's listened to, just like every single situation in the world, just like every other person in the world, it says what it wants to say and it passes through. Nobody in the, in the 64 years that I've been alive, nobody has ever said to me, I want you to agree with what I'm saying. All they've ever wanted was to be heard and understood to be loved and accepted for what they believe. I believe that's what our mind wants because that's what we, when we see that in everybody else, all we need to do is listen to it, accept it, have it come in, come out, just say, bless it on the way, as it comes in, listen to it on the way out, bless it, and we're done with it. We don't, maybe that's the simplest practice that could possibly be that allows the mind then to stop yelling and creating all this turmoil and havoc and chaos. I would love your perceptions on that. I'm in complete agreement. And what has, uh, what has transpired for me in that process that you just described is the recognition that the vast majority of the time, formerly, I was not able to listen because I believed the mind. I thought the mind was me. And I didn't understand that the mind was a mechanism and that its job is to navigate and, and uh, help this system survive on the planet. I didn't, I didn't understand that. And through the listening came an understanding. And with the understanding came a, a deepening 
Mm -hmm. a deepening of my acceptance and appreciation of the mind. And in my process, the, the, the fundamental, the fundamental principle of my process is so same. When I say my process, that's ridiculous, but um, the fundamental process that I am driven to promote, I'll say it in that way. Sure. Yeah. Total and complete acceptance of all things, all people, all situations at all times, including myself. Love it. Love and it. And that practice right there. Totally. Will remove the motivation for the mind to speak. Yeah. And when the motivation for the mind is gone, then one can choose how to utilize the mechanism of the mind to have the experiences or create the epic life that you want to create. And that's where your your ability to effectively contextualize comes into play. And that, for me, that's the fourth component. If you can't, if, if you continue to use language that you were taught by the people around you, then you will continue to create experiences that activate the mind. You actually have to recontextualize life completely such that you aren't triggered back into a survival state, which is the fundamental nature of the mind. Hmm. So that listening and observing that you're talking about, 1000%. Most of the people that I, so I, I, I just come from a totally different background, Danny. Um, I'm, my background is, is literally hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hmm. My, I have spent since 1993, I have been coaching people one-on-one -on -one, every single week through their process. Mm -hmm. And I've been accountable and on the hook for producing results. And so the frameworks that I've created over these last 20 plus years have been about what I know with certainty will work to get someone to be at peace and still kick ass and still be effective and still be responsible and still have integrity and still operate and function in life, but to have both. Yeah. And so the listening and observing the mind, profound, accepting and appreciating the mind, profound. What's the system for doing that? That's yeah. my deal. Yeah, beautiful. If you had one thing that you wanted to leave people with from all the chatter. Cause I love how both like I taught my main thing is listening and I love how much I speak uh, to talk about listening. It's like such an oxymoron um, of all the things that you've spoken about and of all the things that you've discovered, if people were going to walk away with one thing from you that, that would be your gift to them, what would be that gift? What would be that one thing you would tell them? Your mind is not your friend. Hmm. It doesn't actually care about your goals and dreams. It's not really interested in your peace and your joy and your flow. And if you're being completely honest, what it's concerned about are matters of survival. And if you are listening to these words right now, you are not in a survival situation. Mm -hmm. You are working on thriving. And that's your birthright this time around. We couldn't have this podcast 200 years ago. We would have to do it fairly in secret in some you know, closed place to not be killed by everybody else. Today, we get to talk about it freely because the platform for our existence is so set that you, my friend, get to think about how do I be at peace? What a delicious, what an amazing thing. Your mind is not your friend. It is a mechanism Fabulous. designed to keep you alive longer. Play with that. See what happens. Love it. The last question that I ask is, has a follow-up question to it, um, but it's how I end the podcast all the time. When you look around at the world and surely in the last, in the evolution of the world, we are not stoning people to death and we are not, uh, we have evolved in some ways incredibly well. But with all the divisiveness that exists in our world today and, and all the noise that's in our world today, 
Is this the world that you always dreamed that you would hand over to your children and your children's children? Uh, so the answer is yes, with this caveat. I don't, I'm not concerned about my children. My children are infinite beings like you and I. Uh, I experience them as beings of choice. And I also look around in the world and I am absolutely blown away by how delicious all of this divisiveness is. Because if we look at the actual metrics, the, the measurements of what is occurring in the world, the experience worldwide of humanity is exponentially more survivable, more pleasant, more enjoy, exponentially. Just look at the statistics. Simultaneously, as we are going through our process of evolution, we, are, we have never been more aware of ourselves evolving. And evolution is so simple. It is new ideas like you and I and our listener. We are the new ideas, and we're, we're old ideas, but we, are, we keep pushing through Joy, peace, love, certainty, kindness, happiness, fulfillment, oneness, unity. We keep pushing through what is essentially the status quo. This is mine. Don't take it. Don't mess with my stuff. I want wrong, right? There's a survival framework that has become the status quo. And there's a giant movement of people pushing through. That creates that discontent and that discontent is exactly exactly what we need love it rejoice love it um matthew i i knew walking in that the conversation was going to give people a chance to see the world differently and i want to thank you for opening up new perspectives one of the things that I talk about in general is we see the world from one degree, and that's the degree that we look at the world from. But there's 359 other degrees that make up the 360 of our life. And until we're willing and open to, uh, to embrace the 359, until we're willing to allow other people with other thoughts and processes to infiltrate into the being of what we see, we'll only continue to always see what we see. And the beauty to me of the mosaic is we know what we see. We live in our silos of like-minded communities. We live in our, in our silos of like-minded thought. But it's in the glorious nature of, of finding and communing and talking to people who see the world differently than we do that makes the possibility of the impossible possible. Because why is anything unpos impossible now? It's impossible because we don't see a way to make it possible. And as long as we stay in our silos of like-mindedness, we'll always continue to see the world exactly the way we see it. But as soon as we allow someone that is a disruptor, like Matthew, who may not claim himself to be a disruptor, but every concept, every way he sees the world is, is meant to change perceptions, to open up perceptions, to give other perceptions, to allow you, to invite you to see the world differently. Until we allow disruptors to disrupt our silo, until we walk in open fields rather than siloed environments, we will have one silo fighting against another silo, saying their way is right and their way is right and their way is right. And, and none of them are right because we're just in conflict. For those of you who have listened and enjoyed this podcast, I can't recommend to you highly enough that you go to Matthew's website, which is matthewferry.com that you pick up a copy of his book on Amazon or wherever books are sold, which is The Quiet Mind, The Epic Life, and that you sign up and we will put his, his, his uh, URL for how you can hear his, his uh, meditations, his thoughts, his, his ideas, his, his recorded sessions on how to change you, the way you think in the world and how to, how to uplift yourself to a place where the noisy mind becomes the quiet mind. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking your time and coming on to this, for allowing me to delve beneath the curtain of the teacher and to show up as the, as the hum, beautiful human being that you are. And to I hope that this will be the beginning, not the end of our conversations, because 
I think there's something here for all of us. And for me and you in particular, I see a place where we might be able to play that I would love to engage and see if that can work. So Let's do it again, maybe we can, uh, maybe we can go through practices for people next time. Love it. That, and, and if, if we don't do it here, we're going to put you in, in touch with those places where those practices can happen. Because here's one thing we all know. The world is full of noise. Our mind is full of noise. And until we quiet that mind, we have no idea what anybody's saying, including ourselves. One of the big works that I do is, is try and get people to get in touch with themselves, to hear what their own soul is saying to them. And there's so much noise that we, they don't even hear what, what's going on. So I invite you, if you like this podcast on iTunes, to please like us. Uh, if you had loved it and want to and want to give, we only accept five star reviews. No, I'm teasing. You can review it any way you want, but we would love five star reviews. And I want you to, to invite you to come back for the next episode we have and and be a part of the Mosaic Podcast, where people like Matthew come on all the time to explore new ways of seeing the world and new ways of connecting. Thank you again, everybody, for being here. Matthew, thank you for coming. Um, with big love. Until next time.